Looks good. Okay, so we will start recording. Just make sure you hit the continue button so that you can continue to be part of the program and listen to everything that's going on uh, later on also. And then uh, with us today, we do have Pam Bennett. She is a horticulture specialist um, and assistant professor with the Ohio State University Extension in Clark County. She's also the state master gardener coordinator for the program and just recently became the interim director of the Chadwood Chadwick Arboretum and Learning Gardens. So Pam, take it away. All right, Gigi, thanks. Appreciate it, appreciate y'all being here this morning. I see some names on here that I've seen before, Elizabeth Betts, Deb Garner. Uh, some of you may have seen this before. Um, I have cut some things out though, because Gigi asked me to focus on annuals that will fit into your perennial gardens. And as many of you know, when it comes to perennials, there is sort of a downtime, a little bit of a downtime when things just aren't looking good. I look out at my perennial bed and right now I do have some daffodils, tulips, I've got some uh, magnolias. I have some bloom going on right out there at this point, but in between that spring, summer, summer, fall, you may get to a point where you're, you're missing some color. And even if you're not missing color, annuals can always be added to your perennial garden to add that additional pop. So I'm gonna give you a little bit of background first in terms of where this information is coming from. These are not plants that I've just picked up and put in the ground and think, oh, they're really good. This is based on research here in Clark County. We started years ago doing this and every year we evaluate all the different varieties that the growers and breeders enter into the trials and we determine which ones do best with very little maintenance. This is an example of our old site where we used to have our demonstration gardens at the extension office before we moved. And we are now in a new location, which is really exciting. We are uh, located in the Snyder Park Gardens and Arboretum. And up in the left, in the upper left-hand corner you see, this is the part of the former golf course, Snyder Park, that we are going to be managing and maintaining over the next many years. Our field trials or our cultivar trials are right in this area just outside of the clubhouse. The bottom is an artist's rendition of what this would look like in the future. And we do have the pavilion in, we put this in last year. The clubhouse is this white area and between the pavilion and the clubhouse will be the Springfield Foundation feature garden, which will go in in May. And then next spring, our trial beds will be moving right behind the clubhouse and the pavilion. So these will be indeed right front and center showing off um, the, the great cultivars of annuals that are available on the market today. We are also an All-American Selections trial ground. We are one of two in the state of Ohio. We just uh, had a new one come on board last year and I believe it's up north somewhere and he is going to be doing container trials for annuals. But All-American Selections is a little bit different in terms of the trialing techniques and the trialing uh, variables. It's a comparison trial where a grower enters a new variety and it's compared to two or three or one other variety that's already on the market and that might be a good one to use, um, but this might, the new one might be better. So if the new one's better, then it, it, it actually receives one of the All-American Selection designations. This is the shade part of the garden. Currently, we have our shade plantings under a very heavy Norway maple tree. So it does get pretty intense shade. And as I talk about this to the plants today, if I don't specifically say it's growing in the shade, you can make the assumption that it's growing in full sun. So when there is something that we're trialing in the shade, I will make sure to mention that to you so that you know it is indeed in the shade. Our soil, fortunately or unfortunately, it depends on how you look at it, is a rich, well-drained, loamy soil. And because it's so well-drained, we actually have to water or irrigate more often than we did at our old site, which was a crummy, compacted clay, old cornfield. So we have changed our watering habits because if we didn't water a little bit more, we wouldn't have plants. However, we still don't go with a normal one inch of irrigation or precipitation per week. We give them what they need to keep them alive. And you can see the, the pH there and we do till it to a depth of 14 inches in the spring to get them uh, set up and ready to go. We're planting everything right now. We're planting here on camp or we're planting on campus and we have some plants here in Clark County. We start them in the greenhouses, then we plant them out the third week in May. We put them on two foot centers for the smaller plants 
And those plants that are trialing, vining or trailing will put them four foot centers to give them plenty of room. And we always evaluate six plants per species or per cultivar. We do fertilize one time and we fertilize with a triple 14 slow release fertilizer. And of course that is based on a soil test. Like all of you have done a soil test before, correct? And we only fertilize one time. And I mentioned irrigation in Clark County in terms of how often we irrigate. And the key here is that we don't deadhead. These plants are pretty much on their own. So we are giving them minimal, minimal maintenance. Um, we do not do any deadheading during the season. So as you look at these particular plants that I'm sharing with you, know that they have not been deadheaded. In addition, we don't use additional pesticides, we don't mulch, and we don't use fertilizer because our trials in Clark County are kept on the lean side. We want them to do really well in very little maintenance, very little input, which is what most gardeners would like to have, most commercial landscapers would like to see in their, in their plants, right? Now, there is an asterisk here. We will use pesticide if it's absolutely necessary, necessary to maintain the integrity of the trial. And I will mention to you if we have indeed used pesticides on any of these plants. We have an evaluation, monthly evaluation. We rate them from one to five. One is like crappy, it's not very good. Five is a really good plant. I'm gonna plant that in my garden. You can go to this website listed and find out the details on the trials, how they did monthly and then their, their average score and so forth. But I'm gonna be sharing with you some of the top rated plants that would work really well either in your landscape or incorporating them into your perennial gardens. Now, that said, new this year with the cultivar trials, I'm also gonna be doing the cultivar trials on campus and we're going to have different variables on campus. Because of the location, because of the people that see the trials on campus, we are going to be doing more maintenance and more care on them than we would be doing in Clark County. So breeders this year are now gonna have two options. They're gonna see how those plants are doing with very little maintenance in Clark County and how they do with a higher maintenance here uh, on campus at Chadwick Arboretum. So we will, excuse me, we will mulch, we will deadhead, we will fertilize on a regular basis um, and we'll have a little bit different results. So you'll be able to see both sides of the spectrum how these plants are doing in these trials. With that, we're gonna go ahead and get started so that we can get through my, I don't know, I have 285 slides and we can do that in the next 45 minutes, right? So here we go. Alternanthera. You may know Alternanthera from um, going to Kings Island or Cedar Point and seeing those clock designs where they have those real cool numbers or numerals and they change them out every day. That's the Alternanthera red threads and gold threads that they have used. They're very easily trimmed. The newer varieties of Alternanthera, this one is Purple Prince, are excellent for ground covers, containers, hanging baskets. This is in full sun and look at the color of that and how that stays that nice burgundy color almost all season long. Um, it's a low growing plant, about eight inches in width, about four, six inches in height. And it has just that, that beautiful burgundy color. And in my opinion, you need to put it with something else. If you have just that in landscape or mixed in with a perennial bed, it's gonna get lost. But if you put this with chartreuse foliage, white colors, a variegated green and white plant, it's really gonna make colors stand out. Angelonia is another one that can be inserted into your perennial beds. Angelonia has different heights, different sizes, uh, depending on the cultivars. Serena is a really short compact, uh, but this would be a good one to insert in between plants um, during the growing season because it's gonna bloom all season long. And it has a tall upright form and the flowers uh, grow upwards on their spikes. Now, I'm also gonna share with you today um, the different, the many different, um, pollinator plants that are good to use in the landscape because that's a big thing right now. Everybody wants to plant pollinator plants. However, this particular plant is not a pollen source for our pollinators. It is a sterile plant. So it's not going to read seed. It's not going to provide pollen. My philosophy is provide some of everything. I have pollinator plants out in my landscape. I have a, a quarter acre prairie. I have sunflowers all over the place. I make sure I have plenty of pollen. But I also enjoy some of these introduced cultivars. Uh, I know people are really, you know, sometimes people get really anxious and make sure they have all these pollinator plants. But I'm not one of those people who are going to do just all native plants, all pollinator plants, and not enjoy some of the introduced cultivars. So don't let people make you feel guilty if you're planting things like this. You know, it's okay to have them. But on the other hand, 
make sure you incorporate some of those pollinator plants into your garden because that's gonna help our pollinators as well. This one, as I said, is sterile. It's not a pollinator plant, but it makes great color. Usually pinks, whites, and uh, purples are the, the main colors you'll see. Other plants that can be easily incorporated into your perennial garden include the begonias. And there are quite a few species of begonias out today, or cultivars rather, that are fantastic. You know, back in the day when I was just getting into gardening back in the 70s, the old begonia, whiskey, vodka, and gin were the, the main cultivars, the main ones available. Um, and they just are, you know, you don't see them hardly anymore at all. They were the variegated, or not variegated, but the different colored leaves, burgundy leaves, green leaves, but very small, very short. <clears throat> Excuse me. A couple of years ago, they came out with Big Whopper and Megawatt. And I'm telling you, these things are just, are just, are really pretty amazing. This is a planting in full sun of Big Whopper and Megawatt. You can see them all kind of grouped together. And they just are absolutely floriferous. There's color all over these plants. They also will take shade. They can be easily grown in a shady situation. Obviously, they're going to be a little bit different in the shade, a little taller, a little more open between the nodes. Um, the colors might be a little richer, but they do great in sun or shade. The only downside, in my opinion, to begonias is number one, well, two downsides. Number one is if they get too wet, you're going to see some phytophthora and some other rots. And number two, <clears throat> they are extremely brittle. So if you have you know, kids in the area, basketballs, playgrounds, whatever, they are not the plant to put in that area because they break easily. And excuse me, I'm gonna stand up because I can't seem to sit still right now. Um, a couple of years ago, we were quite astonished. I went in, it was probably around September and looked down and this is what we saw in terms of the begonias. And I was like, what the heck? Well, we have deer in our property. We have deer in the gardens. And we know that there are certain plants that the deer absolutely adore. And I was really surprised because I have never seen deer bother begonias before. This was the first time that we've had this problem. And they just, you can see where they just nibbled down on the leaves, down to the bottom of the foliage, just took some of the stems off. Uh, but it was at the end of the season, so we weren't too worried about it. But the next season, we had no problems at all, and we haven't had any since. So it was one of those adages where, you know, if the deer get hungry, they're going to eat whatever's available. And begonias are not usually something they prefer. But when they're hungry, they're going to eat. I love some of the celosias, particularly the new ones that have come out on the market. You know, back in the day, you would have to deadhead celosias to really keep them looking prime. This series called First Flame, this is First Flame Red, First Flame Yellow, absolutely phenomenal. This was a picture taken in late August, early September without any kind of deadheading whatsoever. Um, so if you're going to get that kind of color and that kind of impact without deadheading, that's a great plant to add to the garden. This one in particular gets about eight to 10 inches tall and it's about a foot up to the height of the bloom. Another really good one that we had in the trials many years ago, but we also just had it back in, I think it was last year as a, a comparison plant in the All American Selections. This one's called Arabona Red. The plumes are a, li a little bit thicker, a little bit more robust. And again, about 12 inches tall to the top. Both of these make great dried flowers. You can cut them and hang them. And this picture was in November last year, the first Wednesday in November. It's when we have our plant cleanup in the gardens. We take everything out except any of the perennials in the trials. And we, I had a hard time really quite honestly taking this out because it still looked good. So we took the best ones, we hung those upside down and you could use those then for bouquets and dried flowers throughout the winter months. But this is another really great Celosia that did not require deadheading all season. The next group is the Cleomes. Now, many of you may have Cleomes or spider plant, they call it. It is a wonderful cottage garden plant. It is a self seeder, so it will just go everywhere. Now that is the species. It is great for pollinators. This is the cultivar Senorita, Senorita Rosalita, Senorita Blanca, Picania. There's several different cultivars available. They are sterile. And they were bred for two purposes. Number one, they're sterile. So if a landscape contractor puts this in a commercial planting, they're not going to have seedlings the next year because that's that to them is a weed. And they are bred so that their foliage stays top to bottom. Our typical species, Cleome, you can see in this picture right here in the front where all the foliage tends to drop off during the summer. And, you know, I've seen this used in containers. It almost looks like sparklers because they're coming up out of the middle of a container, no foliage attached. Uh, but the idea here is that you're going to have this nice full foliage all the way down to the base of the plant. 
And that was one of the reasons they were bred. And of course, you know, with breeding, sometimes you get, you get good characteristics and you may lose some characteristics. And in this case, you don't have the uh, characteristic of being a good pollinator plant. But again, know that you could put other plants in the landscape, incorporate this into your perennial bed. You can have conflate flowers and all the other pollinator plants and still have color from these plants. Pequena senorita, uh, Pequena rosalita, I'm sorry, is about two foot tall. Um, senorita rosalita is about two and a half, three foot tall. Very bold, very vigorous, and gets about three foot wide by the end of the growing season. I will also take many of these vegetative cuttings, these new genetics, and put them in the shade. Even though they're labeled full sun, this is 70% shade cloth on Pequena road, or uh, Senorita Blanca and Senorita Rosalita. And look at the number of color or number of flowers on there. You know, I would try some of these, particularly the newer vegetative cuttings. Try some of these in the shade, see how they do. You don't have to plant a whole bunch of them. Just try one or two because, you know, when it comes to shade, I'm looking out at my garden and I have um, um, black locust trees. And that's a heavy, dense shade in the summertime. I'm trying to find things that give me color that's just not variegated hosta or um, some of the other plants that you do for texture. This is gonna give me that additional color in the shade. Coleus can be used throughout the garden, but I will tell you one thing, two things, three things, four things maybe. They are sun or shade. So you can put them in a shady area or a sunny area. If you put them in a shade garden, make sure you plant them with something else to make those colors pop out because if you have a dark green or a dark red foliage, it's not gonna show up in the shade. And number two, know how big they get. Some of the plants are nice colors or nice compact plants like your Color Blaze series here, the Royal Pineapple Brandy, Cherry Brandy and Apple Brandy. You know, they're nice and compact. They were probably about a foot, foot and a half by about the same width, nice rounded mounds. The lighter ones are gonna make great colors in the shade. Um, the darker one is not going to show up in the shade, so you're going to have to use something to complement that. This is in the full sun. This is Color Blaze Golden Dreams. These plants can get really large, so depending on what space you have, what area you're using it, what purpose you have in mind, make sure you know how big these plants get. This is Color Blaze Golden Dreams in the shade, and this is what it looks like in the sun. It's very vigorous. It gets really large. Uh, it's a great plant to use for large areas, but it would overwhelm a small growing uh, landscape or a small backyard area. So make sure you know which size you're gonna have and what you're using in terms of the cultivars of coleus. Okay, this, look for this this year. It should be on the market. I love these two plants. They were in our trials last year, introduced uh, to our plant, to our trials rather. Fantastic. On the left, you have colocasia, heart of the jungle. And on the right, you have uh, colocasia coffee cups. Now you can see the heart of the jungle, that heart-shaped leaf. They're about three, three and a half, almost to my shoulder. I'm five, three, so almost four foot tall. Um, bold and vigorous. They, they grow quickly during the summer. This was planted in the ground in full sun. They will also grow in containers, although I found that they took more water to get to this size in containers. But boy, nice plants in a, in a hurry during the season. You can see if you look right, at the, the stems here and underneath there, you see that dark burgundy veination. They have great dark burgundy stems. Uh, Heart of the Jungle, probably about a foot, foot and a half, almost two feet long. And then Coffee Cups, as you can see, kind of has that tendency to curl up, which is where it gets its name. So if you look at these plants, you can see they're kind of curled up. And last year, as I was doing an evaluation, it had been irrigated in the morning. And all of a sudden, the weight of the water just got too heavy and the Coffee Cups just kind of dumped out in the water. It was just a great uh, gardening moment, one of those really cool little moments that you have when you're in the garden or in the landscape. Another one that it'll be interesting to see what happens with this one. It may or may not make it to the market. Um, I suspect they're probably going to do some more work on it. It was entered as a perennial. I suspect that it's going to be an annual, but you know what? It was so pretty and had such great color all season long that I would buy this and plant it every year as an annual. It's kind of a woody plant, so it's like a shrub, um, but it doesn't get very big. It's about a foot by a foot, but it has beautiful double flowers on it. The, the um, uh, buds right here actually provided some really cool interest as well. So the different colors, the cotton candy, the scarlet, the white, really beautiful plants, nice plants all season long. I left some in the ground. We're gonna see if they come back at all. 
Many of our hardy crepe myrtles or so-called hardy crepe myrtles that's supposed to be hardy in our area. I find in my landscape, now those of you living in Southern Ohio may be a little more lucky. I find that they die, they die back to the ground every year and I'm not gonna get them to perform as a shrub or a tree. And I'm not gonna get that beautiful bark because of that dieback. But in some areas you may get the bark, you may get some development depending on um, your location and how hardy they might be. But I, I kind of watch for this plant. I'm anxious to see how it does again in the next year. Something that's definitely a great plant to incorporate into your landscape and into the perennial garden. And, and it's really nice because it has this architectural structure to it. It adds so much texture and so much uh, integ not integrity, what I wanna say. It's a real good feature plant for the garden. And that's the cypresses, baby tut and king tut. Now here's a really good example of a plant that performs differently under different conditions. So I mentioned our trials in Clark County, which are on the lean side. And then the trials in Columbus at Chadwick, which are on the more, you know, well cared for, lots of water, lots of nutrients and so forth. Um, in Clark County, baby tut's going to be a foot tall. On campus, it'll be three foot tall. King tut in Clark County is going to be three feet tall. On campus, it's going to be six feet tall. These are plants that love water. So the more you water them, the bigger they're going to get. This is king tut in a four and a half foot container. Perfect location for it, perfect planting, but it gets lots of water, so it's gonna be nice and large. In the perennial border or in the ground, wow, just coming up, that architectural feature coming up out of all the other plants gives you so much visual appearance to the eye. Think about taking away that, that layer of, uh, that second layer of that plant and how boring that planting might be. And then a few years back, they also introduced Prince Tut, which grows like King Tut, but stays shorter. So it's more of a compact foot, foot and a half in height. So great plants to introduce into your perennial border and could become a specimen plant or a feature plant in the garden. Euphorbias have been around quite, quite many years. This is Diamond Frost, one of the first ones that came out. Hot, dry, it just did fantastic. Then they came out following that with Diamond Delight, which is a double flowering, which actually gave you more flowers. And we put double delight in the shade. And wow, you know, if you want, again, if you want something that's gonna bring out those perennials that are in shade, this white was just absolutely wonderful. White is also a great plant to use for night. You know, when the moon reflects on that white, you're gonna see these plants in the garden at night as well. Um, and then a few years back, uh, Proven Winters came out with this one right here called Diamond Mountain. So Diamond Delight, Diamond Frost were kind of compact, 12 inches by about 12 inches, kind of spread, can use in a container or as a border, but Diamond Mountain was kind of bred to be taller and more vigorous. So it has the capacity to uh, compete with other plants. And it was vigorous. It was about a foot, two and a half, two, two and a half feet tall. And here it is in with those coleus that are very, very robust, very large, doing just fine. And Euphorbia is an excellent pollinator. A lot of our small native bees, uh, some flies, a bunch of different uh, insects we found hanging around this plant. And not being an entomologist, I couldn't tell you which species, but I know that it was very attractive to many of the pollinators. Here's diamond snow that came out a couple of years ago. We had this in the shade last year and it actually did better in the shade than it did in the sun. Just a beautiful plant to put in shade to give you that. I mean, think of a, think of a perennial that gives you that much color in the shade. It's kind of hard to come up with something that's gonna be that vivid. And then diamond snow, again, in full sun a couple years back, just double flowers, great plant, great performer in the landscape. Now, something that you may put in your perennial garden, but may not, it is a pretty cool plant called Evolvulus. This one has blew my mind. Um, it would be a border plant at best, and it would take full hot sun. Um, so if you wanted to do like a monochromatic color scheme with blue juncus, a uh, blue dark juncus, the, the grass, the, not this, it's juncus, it's not a grass, but it looks like a grass in the bottom left-hand corner there. Or if you had some hot perennials like some of your coreopsis or cone flowers matching the blue in there, giving that, that hot um, across, across from the color wheel color, really cool combinations. So a plant that is sold as a perennial in most cases, many of the cultivars that you see are perennials, but if you've had perennials, you notice that they don't always come back, or Gallardia rather, they don't always come back every year. They tend to last maybe two, three years at best. They might reseed, but I have a planting out there that I'm finding one or two that are coming back, but they just don't come back consistently. 
So some of the growers are looking at this now as an annual. This is a proven winner's introduction called Heated Up Yellow. There's also Heated Up Red. It is a fabulous pollinator plant, lots of pollinators around it. And it is a great low growing, kind of a ground cover cottage garden type plant to put in. Now, two years ago, I had it in my landscape and it came back last year. I let it reseed. It did not necessarily reseed, but it came back from the, the base, which, you know, it might've just been in the right location. This year, I haven't seen any start to grow yet, but we'll see if it comes back. But again, it is something that could be easily used as an annual and give you just massive color in a early uh, part of the season on into a frost. Gonfrina. So I've been around gardening since the 70s and I can remember selling, oh, Purple Globe, Strawberry Amaranth, you know, the, the old Gonfrina that were available. There's a lot of great Gonfrinas on the market and they're excellent to incorporate into a perennial bed. Um, this is Gonfrina Fireworks. Here is fireworks in a bed at Franklin Park Conservatory many years ago. Gonfrina is fantastic for pollinators. Butterflies love them. The other thing about this plant, it gives you that movement in the garden. So it's gonna give you a lot of nice motion uh, aesthetically in the garden. And last year to, oh, actually, I think this has been out like three or four years now, Gonfrina truffula pink. And that's this one right here. Perfect plant for pollinators. You can see it side by side with Diamond, uh, Diamond Mountain Euphorbia. Nice movement in the garden, gets probably about two feet tall. Excellent for cut flowers, excellent for dried flowers and another really great fill in plant. I thought I would put a container of Diamond Mountain and Gonfrina truffula pink together. And how cool would that be having this nice, you know, interplanting of pink and white, you know, just really cool looking plant. Um, and it didn't quite work out that way because the Diamond Mountain Euphorbia is vigorous, vigorous. I had to cut it back three times just to let the truffula pink kind of get up and get some sunshine and start growing. It ended up towards the end of the season looking good, but it just pointed out to me that that Diamond Mountain really is a vigorous grower. Something you will probably find on the market this year, and I think you will really like this, this is Gonfrina Ping Pong. It's going to give you what you see right there all summer long once it gets growing. We had this color from July clear to the end up to a frost. A great dried flower, cut flower again, and excellent for pollinators, but a very nice round shaped globe about you know, maybe a foot by a foot in height and shape. Um, and just really, one of my volunteers called it a Dr. Seuss plant because it just had all that cute little, you know, eyeball like purple eyeballs all over the plant. So a really nice plant to have in the landscape. This, unfortunately, or fortunately, this is a sterile sunflower. Um, it was bred because it is a multi-branched sunflower that will bloom all season long. If you have sunflowers in your landscape, you'll know how most of them will give you that first flush of growth, they'll bloom, and then they'll be finished. You won't see additional blooms all season long. This one, once it starts growing, it's going to bloom all season long. Now it starts out looking like this and you may buy it and say, wow, this is not all that great of a plant. You may not even buy it because it's not that impressive, but you get this three by three foot mass of sunflowers all season long and they can be used for cut flowers. And the one thing people like to use them for in terms of cut flowers is that if you've ever cut sunflowers, you put them in your container and then the next morning you go out and you have a circle of pollen right underneath every single sunflower on your kitchen table or your counter because they do have lots of pollen. So these not having pollen actually make a good cut flower for market because they're not gonna provide that additional pollen. Yes, the birds come after them. Yes, the birds like to look at them but they don't get their pollen from them. But again, I've got multiple sunflowers growing all over my landscape that provide that pollen and provide that sunflower seed for the goldfinches. So I'll still plant these because they are so vigorous and show so much color. Hypoestes. Back in the days when I started in my garden center career in the late 70s, I would sell polka dot plant as a foliage plant. It would be in the greenhouse and it'd be in a little two and a quarter inch pot and it was like 99 cents for a, a plant. Now it's being used as an outdoor plant and as you can see here it's in full sun and you can also see it in the next slide growing in the shade. A little bit different characteristics from sun to shade, more compact, colors a little more faded in the sun, a little longer, a little taller between the nodes and the shade, a little richer color, but it would make a great plant to fill in some of those empty spots or where you have foliage that's still growing. 
for instance, where early in the season your coneflowers are foliage or after your peonies bloom, put these in and among there to provide that color in the perennial garden as well. Sun patients and your hybrid New Guinean patients are all resistant to impatient downy mildew. Um, although right now people are starting to grow impatients again, growers, nurseries, greenhouses are starting to grow them again. Our growers are doing a really good job of using fungicides to prevent impatients downy mildew that kind of shut the whole impatient market down many years ago. Um, so, you know, I would grow them again as well, put them in a shady area if I had those in the perennial bed. But the sun patients and the hybrids are resistant. The sun patients should not um, confuse you because they do not grow in full sun. When the New Guineas came out back, I think maybe in the early 80s, somewhere around there, you know, the, the growers were telling us, hey, these are great for growing in full sun, no problem. Well, we all learn by putting them out in the full hot sun that they just really don't grow all that well in full sun without lots of water. So if you're willing to water them on a daily basis, they will grow in full sun. The best location for your sun patients and your New Guinea patients is a morning sun and shade in the afternoon protected from that hot afternoon sun, particularly if you're not irrigating. As you see, there's lots of color combinations. There's lots of foliage combinations. Here's one with the orange foliage or orange flowers with green and yellow foliage. Compact is on the right, vigorous is on the left. Beautiful colors. And I'll be very honest, these are excellent plants for very low maintenance. They, they self, um, self, what is it? Dead, self deadhead, deadhead themselves. They drop their petals so you don't have to deadhead them. I can't tell you in all the years I've been trialing, and as soon as I say this, we'll find some kind of invasive species on it. I haven't seen any insect or disease problems on the New Guineas or the sun patients uh, in general. So I think they're great plants to use. I think people are kind of stuck on impatience, the species impatience. And I certainly would try these in terms of giving you that massive coloration. Sweet potato vine. Yes, the common question is, can you eat the potatoes? Yes, you absolutely can. They're not very pretty. They usually get big and gnarly because we let them grow all season. They're not bred to be an edible, but you can eat them. But the sweet potato vines are just numerous as to what you see on the market. Some of these are older, they've been around. Some of them aren't even on the market anymore. We just kind of seem to get all kinds of different cultivars every year. Let me tell you about breeding. The breeding doesn't stop. Once they put a new cultivar on the market, they're always looking at how we, you know, how can we improve this one to make it even better? So some of the newer ones that we're trying, the Sweet Caroline, the Illusion, they're newer genetics because they're better. They have more, more characteristics to them, better features or what have you. And this one, the emerald lace, you can see that really deep cut foliage. It actually gives you some architectural feature to it, some texture, contrast. And this particular one, Sweet Caroline Raven, I was very impressed with. There is no dwarf sweet potato vine. Um, it would be just very expensive to really propagate something that was a dwarf sweet potato vine. But this one, it was very compact, very well maintained. And that dark purplish, almost black foliage was spectacular. And this was in full sun. Um, I'm anxious to see how it do does again this next year. I'm indeed going to plant it in my landscape. I just, it's just a fabulous color. But again, those dark colors have to have something to offset them. This would not stand out as much in this picture if it didn't have that chartreuse um, emerald lace illusion or emerald illusion, if it didn't have those colors going with it to kind of pop that out of there. The next one, these are your lantanas. There are some really pretty lantanas out right now. This is Luscious Royal Cosmo that we had this last year. And just look at this flower. Starts out pink buds, opens up into the yellow flowers, and then fades to a pink where you have all different colors on the same flower. Lantanas are fantastic for pollinators. My top three pollinators based on observation in our trials would be salvias, lantanas, and verbenas. Those are the three plants that really are, are just full of movement in the middle of summer mid-afternoon when the pollinators are out in, in full. Uh, this is another one, Luscious Red Zone. These two are both very compact. With lantanas, you've seen them all different sizes in the market the last many years. Some small, short, compact ones going all the way back to Patriot Series, which was like three to four feet tall. So the ones today that are coming out, they're looking at these more compact, even growth habit. Beautiful coloration, Luscious Red Zone and the Royal Cosmo. Lucky Flame Improved, another great color. 
and then this. So lantana like it hot and dry. They do not like cold. They do not like it wet. So if you have an area like with cone flowers, like with some of your other, um, let's say Rudbeckia, Coreopsis, those plants that like it dry, these are great to put in along with them. Once they get too wet or the temperatures cool down at night, and this was about two or three years ago, we had a couple of weeks in July where it got cool and damp. This is what happened. They'll set their flowers again, but if you don't have a nice hot August, they're not gonna have flowers set. And you'll notice they'll start to decline in terms of the amount of flowers going into September with shorter days and cooler nights. Um, so they do like it hot and dry, which is even better. Find that parking lot, parking island situation and put these plants in that area. Ornamental, um, ornamental millet is excellent, excellent to incorporate into a perennial bed, particularly some of the taller ones like Jester, putting it in the back of the border or adding that structure, you know, if you want to give it some kind of interesting structure or texture to the garden, just great colors, great in masses, great if you put three or four of them together, uh, but they're really nice to incorporate into your perennial beds. This is one that's been out for many years and I haven't seen it used too much around here, but I did see it a couple years ago in Wisconsin and it just, it just looks fantastic. This is a short compact one with a chartreuse foliage with the flowers that start out like this. And then the only thing probably that I wasn't really fond of is when they get to this point, I would uh, suggest deadheading them because to me, they just like look like dead squirrels or dead rat tails or something like that. The other thing about many of the ornamental millets, if you let these flower heads go to seed and they lay on the ground, they will germinate if there's plenty of moisture. And I've had one of these flower heads with almost every seed on there still on the flower germinating. So they will reseed prolifically if you let them um, germinate. So I would suggest deadheading. But this was an example of a planting, just a nice background backdrop. Now these are shorter than Jester, a little bit shorter, but our ornamental millets are fantastic for perennial beds. As are the ornamental peppers. Now the problem with ornamental peppers you'll find is that you, you don't usually go to a garden center right now in May and you're not going to find a lot of ornamental peppers available. People just don't gravitate to them in the spring. They look for peppers that are going to be edible, but they don't have much interest in terms of color or impulse buying when you see them in the garden center, except for some of those that are the purples, the dark foliages, the variegated foliage. This is one that's been out for many years and you can actually start this one from seed in the landscape or in your house to get it out early. It's the ornamental pepper black pearl all-American selection winner many years ago. Starts out, you can see here with your purple flowers. Then you get your green peppers that start to turn a purple. And then they get this beautiful black, almost black round pepper that eventually fades to the red. And you can have all of that on one plant, which gives you just really great color starting in July, all the way into a hard frost. A couple others that we've tried over the years, black olive, black pearl, we have several different ones that we've featured. Um, you know, people aren't really into the purchasing of these in the spring. So I usually go in and buy them from seed and start them myself. This happens to be my all time favorite that I would put in any garden, perennial garden container, you know, anywhere. Um, this is New Mex Twilight. And I really like this because you get all of these different color peppers that look like little tiny Christmas lights all on one plant that's about a foot high by about two foot wide. And all these peppers stand up on the plant. So they look really good and you see them. A few years back, we had onyx red, again, a nice dark contrast foliage that you could use in the landscape until they start to bloom. And then you get the nice red coloration on the plants as well. In addition to the millet, our ornamental grasses are really good to use in a perennial garden. Now they are annual. They are not perennial. They are zone seven, zone eight. You may be able to get by with some of them overwintering down in your Cincinnati, Clermont County, River area down along there, but I would be really surprised if they did. This is one called Penicene and Fireworks. It starts out early, kind of a scarlet, and it gets this nice maroon burgundy color, which is about four feet tall with beautiful flowers. Skyrocket, another one, again, an annual, short and compact, about two and a half, three feet tall. Um, so these are great for putting in areas where maybe you're starting a new perennial garden, you've got some bare spots, or adding into perennial gardens that have some empty spots during the summer. 
On the left, you see vertigo that starts out kind of small like this, but by mid-July into August and September, it has this beautiful burgundy foliage that's about an inch wide and it does not bloom. So you're really gonna get this foliage, this nice background. And again, put other plants in and around this, uh, a planting of anemones that bloom in the fall, intermixed in around this would be just absolutely fantastic. All right, your go-to plant for perennial gardens definitely is gonna be your petunias. They can be incorporated just about anywhere. Most of them are gonna be front of the border plants, you know, a foot or less in height, but they will be fillers. They will last all summer. And so many of our varieties today are so easy to maintain that you don't have to deadhead them throughout the season, plant them and let them go. You may have to water more than some of your perennials, particularly to get them established. And if you get into a really dry or a droughty situation, but they certainly do take uh, a lot of abuse and do quite well. These are the low growing kind of spreading type, the Serfinias by Suntory, the Supertunias by Proven Winners. This one, you should all have your you know, chins dropping. Wow. This one is grown in 70% shade and this is Supertunia Vista Bubblegum. And look at the color on that, how well that does in a shady area. So again, if you're looking for some things to put in your perennial shade garden to give you some color. This one works absolutely wonderful. This is snowdrift. They're also kind of downsizing some of these. They're not quite as big or quite as wide. This happens to be probably one of the purest whites in terms of the petunia group that I have seen uh, in a long time. Just a, a beautiful crisp white color. Then you have silverberry, which has been around and ball introduction, color rush pink, shorter, more compact. Um, purple starshine, another Suntory introduction last year that has the white Starlight coloration in the pink flowers, black cherry supertunia, easy waves, you've got the waves. So all of these are kind of in that low growing spreading petunia. This next group of petunias, I call them kind of the boutique petunias. They're pretty, they're nice, but quite honestly, they aren't gonna be the ones you put out way out in the distance and you, you, know, you drive by at 55 miles an hour and they catch your eye. These are not gonna do that. Uh, but they are quite pretty. So you would put them up closer to the house in a perennial garden. These, this is pretty much Picasso. And you can see that green with that little Picati green edge around it. Uh, Picasso in pink. And again, looking at these side by side, you know, you, they just don't like the Supertunia Vista bubblegum. You just don't say, wow. But when you get close up, look at this, just absolutely beautiful. Uh, we got Picasso in purple in several years ago. And at first I asked the volunteers, are you sure you label these right in a greenhouse? And they're like, absolutely. We pay, you know, they pay close attention to them. And then I looked at them side by side. And I'm like, okay, what's going on here? What, how are these different? So on the left, you have pretty much Picasso. And on the right, you have Picasso in purple. And if you look at them closely, on the right here is pretty much Picasso that has the green edge all the way around the outside. You can see green goes all the way around and pretty much Picasso just has it on the tip. So these are indeed two different species with two different genetics. But again, those plants that you're gonna put close up to the house, much like black velvet, phantom. I mean, look at the colors on these, they're really cool, but they're not gonna give you that wow factor. So you could use these where people are walking by your gardens or your perennial beds or uh, in an annual bed as well. This is an annual with Rebecca. Rebecca Herta is an annual. This is mini Becky Flame. This was just super impressive last year. It looked like this probably, I'd say the first of July. We plant, you know, the last week or last three, the third week in May. So it took about a month for it to really get up and going. But boy, once it started, this is pretty much what it looked like all summer long. Stayed like this all summer long, no deadheading all summer long, um, attractive to our pollinators. And then in November, when we finally took it out, this is, it kind of faded to this kind of a, an orange color flower. And it just, it was fantastic. It stayed really nice and compact all season long. So I would look for that one at the garden stores because it would be available. I mentioned salvia as one of the top pollinator plants and all and the perennial salvias, the annual salvias, all of the species of salvias, salvias that I've ever grown are always attractive to pollinators, particularly to hummingbirds. And I always make sure I have salvia right outside my back door here by the back porch because I can sit on the patio and I can hear those hummingbirds coming and playing and, and hanging out and they love the salvia. This is one called Play in the Blues Improved. This is very similar to our old, some of you might remember Victoria Blue Salvia years ago, 
except it has a lot more flowers on it and looks great all season long. Here is early in the season in uh, mid-June after it's been planted. Um, and then you get into the end of the season and it just has this really beautiful kind of uh, very organic cottage garden effect. Another one, Unplug So Blue, that's done well, and Big Blue. So all three of these are about a foot, foot and a half, two foot up to the top of the flower. And they just keep blooming all summer long without any deadheading. Then you have your other species of salvia. This is black and blue, which is probably one of the first ones that came out. And they're known for their flower petals with the different calyx color. And you can see the calyces are all black in this case. Um, black and bloom, another one that came out, a little bit more of a purplish blue color on the flower. The pollinators love these plants, except if they're pollinators like bumblebees or mason bees, they actually are not pollinating, they're, they're robbing the nectar that's in here. Uh, they can't get their big butts down in those petals. So what they typically do is drill a little hole. And if you look real close right here, you can see how they drill that little hole in there and they take out the nectar, rob the nectar uh, and move on to the next plant. But it is loaded with hummingbirds and uh, the bees that can get to the nectar. Another one that's out that I, I think this one's beautiful, it's rock and deep purple. It has that purplish color to it. And rock and fuchsia, rock and fuchsia, when it came out, I'm like, eh, I'm not sure if when we planted it, I'm like, I'm not really sure if I'm gonna like this, but I really grew to like it. It has the pinkish flowers with the mauve calyx. And if you look at it closely, it just, it starts blooming and just keeps right on blooming up the stem. So again, it's not a big problem um, in terms of deadheading. Rock and blue suede shoes came out a few years ago, but I don't think this was gonna make it to market. Um, it just did not have the power in terms of the number of flowers, the appearance. It just did not look like all the other ones in the series. So I would seriously doubt that this one makes it to market. And again, this is why people trial plants. How do they do? How well do they do in the landscape? Also, how well do they do in the greenhouse? So they have pack trials in California every year looking at, okay, so it does great in the landscape, but if it doesn't do good in the nursery or the greenhouse, it's probably not going to make it to market either. Scavola, I have never really been a big fan of Scavola until these last few years with some of these new ones. You can see Whirlwind Blue on the left and then Whirlwind Blue improved. They have indeed, as I mentioned, they don't stop. If they find a pretty good plant that has good genetics, they try to find something that makes it even better. And Whirlwind, Whirlwind Blue Improved absolutely has much better flower power. Here's Whirlwind White Improved, and it's called fan flower because if you look at their flowers, they're kind of shaped like a fan. They are um, nice in terms of texture. I love the texture. But a couple of years ago, I was up at Cedar Point, and th these really hooked me on Scaviola. This is Serdiva. This is a Suntory introduction. And I was walking down the midway there and I saw this beautiful planting of this uh, New Guinea patient and this plant that just had great texture to it. And I couldn't figure out what it was. And as I got closer, I realized that it was the Serdiva, which actually has some smaller flowers in terms of the, compared to the um, other ones. And they just have such a, a, just a really great texture, really not a coarse texture, but just a real angled texture to them. So here's Serdiva Fashion White and Fashion Pink. Good plants to use. One of the things I do know about these is they, the rabbits do like them. In our trials many years ago, we used to have to actually fence these because they would walk around the petunias to get to the scaviola. So you might pay attention to that, particularly if you have rabbits. Once they get established, rabbits don't bother them. Tamaris, same as a verbena. Tamaris grow up the stem. You can see the flowers. They just keep right on growing up the stem. They do not need deadheading. Outstanding pollinators, as I mentioned, these will be loaded with hummingbird moths, hummingbirds, and other bees and so forth. Royal chambray is another superbina. It's another cultivar. Again, you can see how it, it blooms up the stem. It just does a nice job for pollinators. Endurascape pink bicolor. Here are several different cultivars in the landscape. I can tell you that this, we've got one that came in a couple weeks ago for all American selections. It's a new introduction. It is absolutely spectacular. Two different colors, it's really pretty. I can't tell you the name right now because we don't know the names until they're judged and evaluated, but hopefully this one will do really well during the summer because the color of the flower was just phenomenal. Another superbina we had last year, Sparkling Amethyst Improved. And here again, much like you saw with the lantana, 
They don't like it wet or cool. So same year we had the Lantana kind of shut down. The Verbena did the same thing. Verbena, Lantana, put them in a hot, hot, dry area out in the perennial bed and forget them. Typically, I don't even water them if they're in my perennial bed unless we get into that drought situation in August where it hasn't rained for like three weeks and I need to water my perennials too. So they will get watered at that time. Catharanthus, or you might know it as Vinca. This is Titan Blush. There are several cultivars on the market. We had this one last year in the trials. You know, in my opinion, people don't use this enough. And the biggest issue is because people plant them too early and they tend to get yellow. And then sometimes they eventually get Phytophthora root rot. They're extremely susceptible to cold, damp soils and they will get Phytophthora root rot. In all the years since 98 that we have been trialing in Clark County, we only had one year where we had problems with catharanthus and Phytophthora root rot. And that was in, I don't know, maybe 2016 or 17, whatever year it was where we had 30 days of rain in June. And it was chilly and it just rained constantly. We never irrigated that month, but we ended up getting what we suspect was Phytophthora root rot. And when you plant them in early May, if the soils are still cold and damp, which even though the weather is nice and it looks like it's spring, number one, we're probably gonna get busted with a good frost here. Everything's out and growing, we're probably gonna get a good frost. And number two, the soil temperatures aren't quite warm enough yet. So wait until mid to late May to plant these or plant them in a container or a raised bed. Um, you can plant them earlier, but they are absolutely pretty much pest-free. I hate to say 100% pest-free because there's always something, but they're pest-free. I've not seen any major problems on them. No powdery mildew, no Japanese beetles. I mean, they just look like this all summer long and really perform so nicely in a garden. Another one that's introduced by Suntory a few years back called Soiree. And this one is really cool because it has, again, really small flowers compared to the um, other one that has the larger flowers. This has many, many small flowers. So it gives you, again, a little bit different texture to the garden. Last year, we also had the Virtuosa series, Lavender and Deep Purple. Just wonderful colors that'll give you just bloom power, clear up until frost. Most of the plants are about a foot by a foot. They just have that tendency to be very similar to a New Guinean patient in height and width. Except for the Cora Cascade Lilac and the Vinca Mediterranean. These are both your trailing type of Vincas or Catharanthus. They hang down over a basket, over a container, and they do quite well. And you can plant them earlier because in a container or raised bed, you're going to see that they do much better because the soils aren't as cold. Finishing up here with our zinnias. Zinnias can always be incorporated into any garden, any perennial bed. The new ones, Perfusion, Sahara, both of these are introduced by two different companies. Perfusion has smaller flowers, but lots of them. Zahara has larger flowers, but less of them. So overall, you get about the same amount of flower power. They are wonderful for pollinators. Once they start blooming in the summer, they do not stop blooming until a hard frost. They will kind of slow down a little bit in the shorter days and the cooler nights of September, but they give you this maximum color all season long. Plants are about a foot by a foot, just a nice white, white or nice, nice rounded mound. This is uh, sunburst, just really steady coloration that if you want to incorporate some of these in your beds. Again, particularly around those plants that you know, still are growing in the summer. They give you that foliage, but you don't necessarily have um, lots of color there. Like my, I have big masses of some, um, what are they called? They're coming up right now, peonies. I have masses of peonies right now. And when they finish blooming, the plants look okay, unless they get powdery mildew or uh, leaf spot disease. But this helps fill in in that area and kind of takes the eye away from the peonies to our my zinnias. And a final one here, Uptown Gray, a little bit taller. You can see the sunburst on the right there. This was probably about a foot and a half tall and about a foot and a half wide, which is really beautiful flowers. Again, these might get some leaf spot disease, but you don't see where it detracts from the plant. They still look good. I've never seen powdery mildew on these like you would on, uh, let's say, Cut and Come Again, State Fair, the ones that we use for cut flowers. They are fantastic in terms of the... Um, the appearance, even if they do get leaf spot. To wrap up here, um, we have our website, go.osu.edu slash field trials. I would love to say that we've got all the pictures of these plants on there, but I just don't have the resources to take pictures and upload them. I take the pictures, but I don't have the opportunity to get them uploaded to the website every year. 
So if anybody really likes to do stuff like that, let me know and maybe uh, I can work with you and you can help me out here. Uh, but you can also see the fact sheets and the information and all the, the details in terms of the method. I share the method in the beginning because all universities, all companies across the country may have trials, but we all trial things differently. We have different methods, different treatments, and sometimes different evaluation numbers, just like we're going to be doing with campus trials and Clark County trials, different methods, and you're going to get different results. In addition, we are an All-American Selection Trial Garden. As I mentioned, All-American Selections has vegetable trials as well. We have now have national winners and regional winners. If a plant is a national winner, it's done well all across the country, which means it's really a darn good plant. If it's a regional winner, it means it's done well, like in the Midwest region or the South region, but maybe didn't do as good in other regions. So you can go to this website as well if you have any questions about All American Selections. Our gardens are open every day during the season. Daylight hours, of course, it's in a park, so it's daylight hours. And we would love to have you come up. It's Snyder Park Gardens and Arboretum. Come up and visit anytime. Bring your pencil and paper because you're going to want to write down the cultivar names. You're going to want to write down what you like. And the first Saturday in August, if all goes well, we will hold our Garden Jubilee face-to-face uh, -face as opposed to doing something virtually this year. And we'll bring everybody into the gardens and really um, have a great day just kind of showing off the gardens. So with that, Gigi, are there any questions or do we have time for questions? I think we have time for questions. That's totally up to you. I'm sure oh, that these guys wouldn't mind a few minutes extra. I can talk That's, all day on plants. I know you can. <laughs> <laughs> um, the one question that's in the chat is, do you know of a variegated cyperius? Had one a few years ago and can't find it now. Oh, a variegated cypress. Hmm. I have not ever had any in our trials, and I imagine that was probably a very unusual plant because I'm not seeing them on the market, and we have never had one in our trials. But boy, if you find that, let me know. I'd love to have a piece of that one. That sounds cool. <laughs> yeah, that sounds cool. That was the only question in the chat, but if you have a question, feel free to unmute yourself, ask the question. Must have covered everything or else everybody's asleep, right? <laughs> couple of comments. I have a sorry. question. Go ahead. When, when you say a, a flower is sterile, do you mean that specific hybrid or the whole uh, family is sterile? Very good question. That specific cultivar is sterile. So like the Cleome, the species Cleome, <clears throat> pardon me, is not sterile. Um, same thing with the, um, I didn't show Alyssum, the lobularia, the, the white knight, all the cultivars are sterile, but the species is not. So it's just that particular cultivar. When I say it's sterile, it was just that particular cultivar. That's a really good question. Thank you. Yes. <clears throat> we have one that came into the chat. It's from Connie and she's asking, do you have a tall plant for hot, dry? Tall plant for hot, dry, I would use some of the grasses and the millets. The millets would do really well in a hot, dry situation. Either one of those would be great as an, in terms of an annual. <clears throat> Pardon me. Yeah, I have a question on, uh, my wife really likes sunflowers, but so do deer. Do you have any sunflowers that the deer don't like? Uh, no, but I have a product that we use that you might try. Um, I didn't show it. We do use it on our sweet potato vines periodically. It's called Plant Skid, S-K-Y-D-D. -D. Um, now, all of these products that are, you know, deer repellents, they only work for a period of time. This one, I found we've gotten the most control. We get usually get about two to three weeks out of it. There is a powder and there is also a liquid. Now the liquid will tell you before you use it, spray it on a small piece like a leaf or something just to make sure that it doesn't damage the plant. So we tried it on our, we were having terrible problems one year with sweet potato vines and deer. And so we sprayed it on a leaf, it didn't bother it. So we sprayed it. We also put the granular around the perimeter of the bed and got good control for three weeks. It's vile stuff. It's 98% dried blood or blood. And it, it really, it does work. But again, you have to reapply it. And most of these deer repellents are dried blood or blood and they do work. 
but you've got to reapply them. The problem is once the deer get accustomed to the candy shop, you know, our tulips, our sunflowers, all of our plants, they're gonna keep coming back. And of course, the only real surefire way to eliminate them is fencing, which is not always an option because you have to have like an eight to 10 foot deer fence to keep them out. So you might try a product like that and see if that doesn't help you, particularly early in the season before they get a chance to set up shop. Okay, we do have a hand raised by Candy. So Candy, go ahead and ask your question. Thank you. I have on the other side of my driveway, the lawn, is, it slopes down and I have a very large old pine tree, which is, depending on the time of day, it's mostly sun or whatever. Is there anything, because it is a pine tree with all the old pine needles and everything, I don't know what it does to the soil. I mean, what can I plant under that to give it some color or whatever? Because, you know, it's old and some of the bottom limbs have been removed. So it's got open area that you can see. Sure. Is the pine, when you say um, it's old, is it pretty healthy for the most part? Um, no, it's kind of on its decline, but I really don't want to take it down yet. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it, it probably has, I, I could have any of the various diseases that we see on some of our pines and spruces. If I would put anything under there, I would not do an annual unless it was in containers. So two options, I would consider annuals in containers, but then that means you're gonna have to water a little more often. Um, but if I were gonna put something in there, I would put perennials in the ground, simply because every time you go in and plant something and disturb that soil, you're disturbing the root system and furthering that decline, okay? Yeah. So something in there like a ground cover, uh, Lamium, there is a uh, purple cultivar that I can't think of off the top of my head, but it's a variegated green and white flower, foliage with a purple flower, and there's one with a pink, and if anybody can think of the name of these, I've got them in my, I keep looking outside because I've got them right there in my garden. They're beautiful. They're a great variegated color, so they give you that nice color. Um, you could put some daffodils in there for early spring bloom. But I, if you're not going to use containers above ground, I would not plant annuals in the ground simply because okay. you're just, you're digging and you shouldn't disturb the roots. Right. Yeah. I would, yeah, I was, I was looking for something more perennial, so okay. I don't have yeah. to keep doing it. Yeah. Yeah. So some of the ground covers, of course, you could always do hosta. It is a myth that pine needles and spruce needles change the pH, particularly okay. in our area. Okay. Because, because we have that limestone base that pH wants to stay at seven or even above, unless you have an area in Claremont County where your pH, I don't know, Gigi, do you have any areas where it's down five, six? Not yeah. really. Yeah, yeah. So uh, that those pine needles don't change the pH significantly. Okay. Well, cause I know when I, I the, the dirt, well, it's not really dirt, it is soil. I mean, it's really nice, fine, dark, soil under right. that tree and right. everything else right. around here you know is basically clay but right and that's that's an indication of all the organic matter that has broken down over the years yeah. now one thing you'll have to probably water more initially because if it is that you know fine um sandy loam loamy soil it's going to dry out quickly plus you're competing mm -hmm. with the roots yeah. once you get something established though like i said i've got lamium and another one is sweet woodruff it is a great plant, but boy, it grows like crazy. I mean, it will spread into the landscape if you have thin areas. Uh, but there are some good landscape uh, perennials to put in there that, you know, would do quite well under the, the tree. Okay, great. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, I've had a couple more jump in to the chat. Uh, have you noticed whether the newer zinnias are less preferred by pollinators than the old-fashioned ones? I do not. I've never seen or observed the difference in terms of research. But anecdotally, pollinators love them. The perfusion, the Zahara, there's tons of pollinators on them. So I've never actually done the research and I've never seen research on that, uh, but the, the pollinators love them. Do black sunflower seed hulls kill annuals and other plants? So that's a really good question because I've seen some information on that, but I've never quite dug into the research. Where my bird feeder is, I have trouble growing annuals, but it's only because I have so many of them. I mean, the, the shells just pile up, so I try to pull them out and get them out of there. 
So I try not to plant anything in that area. And I can't tell you, I don't know the research on this, but I have seen people suggest that before. Um, so in my area where I have my bird feeders, I usually don't plant annuals. I have bulbs under there and they do just fine. I have uh, the naked ladies. I have some um, hyacinths that are blooming right now. So my bulbs do just fine underneath there. But boy, my sunflower, the black halls, dang, those things really get pretty deep. Okay, next question is, do you recommend any dwarf sunflowers? Ooh, teddy bear. Teddy bear is a really good one. It's got just really fluffy foliage. It's a very nice one to use. Um, that's probably my favorite of the dwarfs. Okay, and the last question is, what product, plant food, fertilizers are used? So it's your option on what you like to use. If you want synthetic, one of the things that we do, we do the uh, slow release fertilizer that gives you fertilization all summer long. So it'll give you a 90 day summer, 120 days. That kind of gives me that basic fertil fertilization. Then if you are using containers, I would use the granules and I would use a liquid periodically, not all the time, but just periodically to kind of boost growth. So there's miracle Grow, Peter's Triple 20. There's all kinds of different fertilizers available. Containers are really important to keep fertilized because they are in a soilless mix and that leaches out quickly. So you need to make sure you stay up with container fertilization. I honestly believe, and this is again, based on anecdotal observations, that we over fertilize our annuals. Keep in mind, we fertilize one time. And what you saw today was the performance out of that one time fertilization. The more you fertilize, the more they're gonna grow, the bigger they're gonna get. Um, many times people get disappointed with their annuals because they get tall and lanky and are overgrown. So if I were you and starting out, number one, what's the most important thing to do first, Gigi? Take a soil sample, amen. don't amen. guess. Amen, amen, you're gonna find that first. Then use a granular and see if you're happy with that performance in terms of growth. You know, why do you use fertilizer if you don't have to? We have a lot of phosphorus in our soils, our clay soils, we have a lot of potash. We could get by without any fertilizer in some cases in our clay soils. Now, because they're annuals, you're taking some nutrients out of the soil every year. This applies to a vegetable garden as well. You don't know how many nutrients you're taking out until you do that soil test. So, you know, soil test first, but if you haven't soil tested, try the granular, granular, granular slow release and don't fertilize with anything else and see if you're happy with the results. I do think we over fertilize. Well, that seems to be all the questions that are in the chat. And unless someone else has one last question to unmute themselves and ask, we will wrap up with uh, today's session. Next week, we will be on April 15th, next Thursday. I will be coming to you from the University of North Texas as my son and I are traveling there for a graduate grad school visit. Already? So, yeah. <laughs> so I will be joining. College. <laughs> Oh, I will be started. I will be there. I'll be with you, but I will be in another state. Um, but next week we have Scott Berline from the Cincinnati Zoo and Botanical Garden, and he is going to be talking about bad bleep 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 trees for poor places. So if you haven't registered for next week's session, please do so. I'll send an update just before we get started. Have a great day. It's not raining here yet. Yeah, good. Gosh, Gigi, I can't believe he's doing grad school already. I, it, I swear he just went to college. Crazy.